Welcome to Acton Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. As we look around the country and the world, we see towering barriers that are holding millions of people back and institutions that should help everyone rise that are not doing their job. We see crumbling communities and one-size-fits-all education. Businesses rig the economy. Public policy stifles opportunity and emboldens the extremes. As a result, this country is quickly heading towards a two-tiered society. People are looking for a better way. In the new book, Believe in People, Bottom-Up Solutions for a Top-Down World, authors Brian Hooks and Charles Koch contend that today's challenges call for nothing short of a paradigm shift, away from a top-down approach that sees people as problems to be managed, toward bottom-up solutions that empower everyone to realize their potential and foster a more inclusive society. Such a shift starts by asking, what would it mean to truly believe in people? Today, I speak with Brian Hooks, CEO of Stand Together and co-author of Believe in People. In the book, Hooks and Koch maintain that the only way to solve the really big problems, from poverty and addiction to harmful business practices and destructive public policy, is for each and every one of us to find and take action in our unique role as part of the solution. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. I'm joined today by Brian Hooks, who is the CEO of Stand Together and the president of the Charles Koch Foundation. Along with Charles Koch, he is the author of the new book, Believe in People, Bottom-Up Solutions for a Top-Down World. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today on Acton Line. Hey, thanks for having me, Eric. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Before we get started, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit more about Stand Together, your mission, and what you're working on? Sure. Well, Stand Together is a philanthropic community. We are a collection of several hundred business leaders and philanthropists, people who have come together to help support thousands of social entrepreneurs uh, across the country, people who are finding new and better ways to solve problems that are holding people back. Our uh, perspectives are are diverse and the the backgrounds of our folks Uh, are also diverse, but we're joined by a common commitment to the idea that as a society, we succeed when we help empower individuals to realize their potential and find ways to to help others by by helping, to help themselves by helping others. And so we end up doing a whole lot of different things towards that goal, um, but, but we've all come together with the recognition that we can accomplish more together than any one of us can on our own. You talk about empowering people. How much of that do you think comes from, as we look at the title of your book, Believe in People, comes from believing in the capacity of people and how much of our problems that you see would you attribute to that a lack of belief in the power of what individual people can do? Well, you've just given the thesis, right? It's a great summary. I, I think it. You know, you can look at the title of the book, Believe in People, and say, well, I mean, that's, of course, we believe in people. But when you scratch the surface of the way that that things work right now in our country, it kind of betrays the idea that actually, for the most part, our systems are set up under the assumption that most people don't have much to offer. And if you start with that assumption, you you wind up justifying some pretty terrible things, some pretty some systems that 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 aren't really designed to work for everybody. And we think that's the opposite of what the country is all about. And that's ultimately the opposite of what it's going to take for us all to succeed together, um, kind of pursue that, that North Star in our country, as we talk about in the book, the ideals that are, are best articulated in the Declaration of Independence. So to get on track, we've really got to start with the basics. You know, we've got to believe in people. We've got to recognize that every person 
has a gift. And as a society, to the extent that we organize ourselves in our education system, in the way that we interact in families and communities, the businesses, and in public policy, we've got to organize ourselves in a way that helps people to discover their gift, develop their gift, and apply it in a way that helps themselves by helping others. And that's, to, to do that and to seriously think about what that means, you've got to start with a recognition that everybody's got a gift. You've got to believe in people. Let's move to the the subtitle of your book where you're talking about bottom-up solutions to a top-down world. I know one of the areas where you're identifying the implementation of top-down solutions, and like we see the consequences of that all around us, is this coronavirus crisis that we're all, the pandemic that we're all living through. What, what are some examples of the way that our approach to that has been far too top-down and has created more problems than it's solved? Well, that's right. So the, the, one of the primary points of the book is this notion that bottom-up solutions uh, that empower people, solutions that invest in those that are closest to the problem and trust them to find new and better ways to address the problem that's in front of them, they, they tend to work better than one-size-fits-all uh, an approach that's imposed from the top down. And, and as, you, as you say, I think that that has played out, unfortunately, in, in very tragic ways over the past year in our country uh, when it comes to the coronavirus. And right out of the gate, uh, this country uh, had a top-down perspective when it came to testing. And so we probably got a, what set back a, at least a couple of months because we had rules in our country that said, rather than trusting the dispersed scientific community, all of the wonderful minds at universities and in companies across the country, to be experimenting and coming up with a diverse way, uh, a set of ways to test for uh, diseases and for viruses, we were going to have it all centralized in a top-down approach within the CDC. So we had all our eggs in one basket, and, and, and guess what? It didn't work uh, when, when the CDC rolled out its initial tests. And so having to scramble to figure out how to recover from that failed top-down approach, I mean, people died, many, many people died because of that. And you can kind of play that out through a number of other um, really tragic um, situations over the past several months, almost a year now, I guess. You know, for, for instance, um, one of the things that became very apparent uh, shortly into the, the crisis, the coronavirus, the COVID crisis, was that laws that prevented doctors from finding the best ways to service uh, their patients, things like um, pro prohibitions on telemedicine, for instance, which were very prevalent across the states, or um, occupational licensure restrictions that prevented nurse practitioners from performing basic medical services for their patients. What, what those did was when the crisis hit, they meant that, you know, if you've, if you've got a, a, a problem a, a, that you want to see a doctor about, rather than being able to get it checked out over the internet, right, over a computer screen, you got to go into a doctor's office and sub subject yourself potentially to being infected with COVID or infecting somebody else with COVID, right? These are top-down prohibitions that made people's lives worse. Fortunately, uh, many of those have now been removed because in the face of this crisis, that those restrictions, those top-down approaches have, have been shown for um, the folly that they are. Um, but there's many, many other um, characteristics of our system that are still characterized by this top-down approach that need to be changed if we're truly going to empower people from the bottom up, in this case, doctors, um, to, uh, to do better. You reminded me of a piece that I read in Commentary Magazine a while back that I think serves as a great example of the, the lack of believing in people that comes from these top-down approaches, where some of the information, especially early on in this pandemic, that was disseminated was untrue. I think the biggest example was we were first told not to wear masks because they were afraid that uh, people would not handle that information well, and they wanted to make sure enough would be available, rather than doing what the CDC's own guidelines actually says you should do in a situation like this, which is be honest with people and treat people like adults who can understand that bad situations are bad, but that they will be able to process it. It seems that there's that kind of uh, lie for the better good approach to it is a clear lack of believing in people's capacity to do the right thing. That's right. No, that's exactly right. You know, it's what Hayek identified um, as the fatal conceit. 
the notion that those experts from afar know better than the people who are closest to the situation as a general rule, uh, or what Bill Easterly, and we referenced this in the book, uh, talked about as the tyranny of experts. It's not that we want to disregard expert knowledge. Of course, we want to incorporate the best knowledge from people who are not close to the problem. But too, uh, too often, uh, when these sorts of decisions are being made, we ignore the kind of expertise that comes from practical knowledge. And so while the example you give is a great example of a mistake that was made by buying into this fatal conceit, we can't trust people, so let's not tell them the truth. Uh, on the flip side, we've got lots of examples over the, in the past year when we did trust people who were closest to the, to the problem, where we've come up with wonderful innovations that nobody from, from outside would have been able to figure it out. And what are some of those examples? The, the distilleries that, that decided to stop making booze and start making hand sanitizer, right, when we had a shortage. Um, you know, we're I'm talking to you at the Acton Institute uh, out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's where I grew up. Um, there's a wonderful distillery there uh, called Long Path that, that did that, and they still sell it. They still sell the, uh, the hand sanitizer. Um, you know, a business that I'm close to, uh, Coke Industries, um, did the same thing uh, when it came to manufacturing parts for ventilators, for instance. Um, not their core business, but they had capabilities that could contribute, that add value uh, in the face of the crisis, and, and so they did it. Um, the myriad examples uh, of that sort of thing uh, when, when we put the trust in people to find new and better ways, in this case, to meet public health standards that benefit uh, the community. What are some other examples of so we, the coronavirus pandemic is an unusual event? I think we can all agree on that. It wasn't something we were expecting. And we've seen the failure of a lot of systems revealed by that. But there are other examples of top-down systems that are more a part of what we would call our normal everyday life that aren't related to the unique circumstance of a pandemic. What are some other examples of those top-down systems that we see failing us? Well, unfortunately... You know, the, the easy example uh, and people usually that you, people usually think of when you talk about top down systems that sort of one size fits all rather than empowering people from the bottom up. The easy example tend to be government policies. And, and there's lots of examples, some of which we just talked through, where government is organized in a top down way. But in the book, we make the case that uh, across what we call the key institutions of society, those institutions that we tend to rely on to help people to, uh, to, to rise and to, to realize their potential. Today, those key institutions across the board are characterized by this top-down approach. And so we talk about uh, the institution of education, for instance, which is critical to people realizing their, their gift and developing the skills to apply it, uh, the gift in a way that helps themselves by helping others. Um, you know, you look at our educational system, both the public school system and uh, in the main, the private, school system, the private schools as well. It tends to teach uh, students from the top down, sort of a one size fits all approach where you teach, uh, your, your teaching is geared towards uh, an, the average student. And the goal of education, it's not stated this way, but if you look at the way that it actually plays out is to basically sort students who's above average Let's put the resources towards them. Who's below average? Let's make sure that they're comfortable, but recognize those above average students are going to wind up taking care of them. That's a horrible system, right? For, for, for one thing, there's no such thing as an average kid. Any parent knows this, right? Each, each student, each person is unique. And so this top-down system, it's guaranteed to fail the majority of students just by design. And so lo and behold, that's what it does. Th think about the alternative approach, though. If we really embraced this paradigm shift, got rid of this top-down approach and, and embraced a bottom-up approach, what would it mean to bring individualized education, education that was tailored to each and every student, that helped them to go on their own unique discovery uh, journey to find their gift, to develop their gift, and then to, to experiment with ways to apply it? Right. All of a sudden, there's no need to rank students. Nobody's below average in, in, in that system. It's the average isn't even a relevant standard. It's how can we help you to find your unique way to contribute in society? And, and so I think you can go through that exercise with all of these institutions. 
Um, and, and if we did that, you know, imagine the human potential, the resource, the, 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 the knowledge resource that we would bring to solve some of these big, big problems in our, in our country. If everybody saw that they had a role to play and that they could contribute based on, on who they are and what they have to offer. You can compare and contrast the example that you gave of distilleries making a pivot to make hand sanitizer when they recognize that need and compare it to something I've spent a good amount of time in Chicago and something I have termed uh, CPS syndrome or Chicago public schools, where you have people acting on very quick and emergent information to move from uh, making uh, whiskey to making hand sanitizer. In Chicago public schools, we have 40 years worth of studies that say the place where kids best learn foreign languages is in the primary grades. And in these public education systems like CPS, where do we teach it? High school. Why? Because that's how we do it. Why? Because that's how we've always done it. And you see the difference between these nimble reactions to quick emerging information versus a 40 year track record of knowing this is the place where kids best learn primary uh, foreign languages and primary grades. And yet that change still doesn't happen. That's a great example. And, and so what's happening there, we have, we've got a system that is designed to cater to the system, right? Well, we ought to change. The evidence says we can change, but we can't change. I mean, the, the system requires, I mean, it's just this way we, we've been organized, right? You got to teach kids in the, in the high school rather than, when they can actually learn this stuff. And, and, and the consequence of that is that everybody loses, right? The students lose because they're not going to be as nearly as engaged or fulfilled as they could be if it was changed. The teachers also lose, right? Because teachers don't want to be in a situation where they can't educate their, the, the kids. So that's a miserable experience for them. And then society loses, because, you know, these kids haven't learned it and, and those that might have that gift haven't had the chance to express it. And so we lose out as well. I think a lot of the times conversations about issues like this, like education, they're framed through what I see as a false choice. This idea that, well, we do it because that's that's good for teachers. And so the students are going to have to take a back seat, or, or we, we got to do something that's good for the students. And therefore, the teachers are going to have all that's wrong. Right. What we're proposing here, this bottom up approach, it's win win. There, there's a mutual benefit characteristic to these these solutions that can make um, everybody better off. As we've noted, some of the ways that businesses and operators in the marketplace have responded and uh, particularly to the coronavirus crisis, I just want to note that uh, Brian will be speaking at our upcoming Business Matters 2021 conference which is an online conference that's going to be held February 25th from 1 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. If you want to register for that, you can visit acton.org slash businessmatters. And we'll put a link to that in our show notes as well. I want to let you know that you can get 50% off your registration using the promo code ACTONLINE when you check out. And I also want to note that if you're interested in the book that we're talking about today, Believe in People, We'll be giving away 10 copies of the book to the first 10 people who email us at book at acton.org. We also receive a complimentary registration for the Business Matters Conference. And we want to thank Brian and Stand Together for helping to make all of that possible. Before we get back to this episode of Acton Line, I want to take a moment to tell you about our newest podcast, Acton Institute Events. The Acton Institute's international events include public lectures, academic seminars, joint participation in panels, the annual Acton University Conference, the Institute's annual dinner, and more, all focused on illustrating our vision of a free and virtuous society characterized by individual liberty and sustained by religious principles. Previous event speakers have included Acton's own Reverend Robert Sirico, Samuel Gregg, and Michael Matheson Miller. Other speakers have included P.J. O'Rourke, Yuval Levin, Anthony Bradley, Arthur Brooks, Jonah Goldberg, Stephanie Slade, Bradley Berzer, Ann Rathbone Bradley, and many others. To subscribe to the Acton Institute Events podcast, look for a link in the show notes for this episode of Acton Line, or just search Acton Institute Events on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Now, back to the show. So let's move on, Brian, to 
you talk in the book about the concept of overlooked people. And you know, in a country of 330 some million people, uh, you could see how people could logically think some get maybe just lost in a shuffle. Uh, but you seem to suggest that there's something more than that going on, that there are people who uh, their individual talent, that remarkable talent that they have that uh, may need some help to be revealed. These people get overlooked by these enormous systems and they're not empowered in the way we would want them to be to make their, uh, to really apply their gift and find out how that changes their lives, how that changes the lives of people around them, and how that could possibly change the world. That's right. So if you take this idea that we succeed when we empower people from the bottom up seriously, uh, and then you look at some of the problems that we've got in this country that feel like they're intractable, things like poverty where the poverty rate in our country really hasn't budged for, what is it now, 60 years, despite having spent almost 15, maybe more than $15 trillion through, say, the war on poverty, federal programs. Uh, or you look at addiction, which is something that we discuss in the book, which is skyrocketing, uh, unfortunately, in the COVID times. Uh, but even before COVID, uh, drug overdoses claimed about 70,000 lives every year. Put that into context, that's more Americans than died in the entire Vietnam War every year. And th these are problems that feel like they can only get worse rather than get better. And, 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 uh, and this top-down approach, um, treating people who are struggling with poverty or people who are struggling with addiction, for instance, as problems to be solved, rather than seeing them as the source of the solutions, which is what we suggest, um, if, if that's the only way you can look at it through this top-down approach, then they do feel intractable. But if you change your perspective and you take this idea of bottom-up seriously, then you realize that the solutions to our country's problems are all around us. We've just been looking in the wrong place. So what we tell a number of stories uh, of these examples, uh, solutions in the book, because we want the book to be a guide for people that are looking to make a difference. Uh, and, and so we try to share some of what we've learned from, from the folks that we've worked with. One of my favorite stories is, is the story of a group called The Phoenix, which is a peer-to-peer -peer physical fitness program for people who are struggling with addiction. Uh, and it's a remarkable program. Um, it has a, a recovery rate uh, that's about twice as good as the best clinical programs. And it, uh, it's been around for uh, over 10 years, started by this remarkable man named Scott Strode in Denver, uh, and, and as Stand Together has worked alongside the Phoenix for the past four years, we've helped Scott to expand into more than 50 cities. And so this works. It works really well. Why does it work? Well, we think the, a big reason it works is because Scott himself, the founder of this program, is somebody who for 10 years struggled with addiction. So Scott is somebody who is closest to the problem. He understands what it means to struggle. He also understands what it means to recover. And he's built the program based on that personal knowledge. But the, the thing is, Scott is, is the kind of guy that most people wouldn't think to invest in, right? Scott is one of these people that, when empowered from the bottom up, can accomplish extraordinary things. And we've got dozens of those, those sorts of examples where people who are closest to the problem tend to be the ones that can find the best solutions. And if you believe in them, you know, rather than kind of write them off or see them as, as the problem to be solved, as the top-down approach does, um, you know, we can break through a lot of these intractable problems. That's the case that we try to make. You mentioned poverty relief. Let's zoom out and, and not only on that specific issue, but on history as well. You talk in the book about some roughly 200 years of a great enrichment that we've lived through prior to the uh, dawn of the coronavirus pandemic, which has uh, understandably caused a lot of problems with people in poverty or people who are hovering above the line, uh, being sunk into it with a, a lot of the difficulties that situation has created. We were living in the age of the greatest poverty alleviation in the history of man. And this is a trajectory that we really have seen over the last few hundred years. We had Jonah Goldberg on this program when his uh, book, Suicide of the West, came out, where he talks about this, what he calls the miracle. And you have this great turn, this great change that happens. And it is a transition from systems that were 
we, we think of differently now because they were hundreds of years ago, but essentially were top-down systems. And this empowering of people through entrepreneurship, through commerce and exchange, to work with each other that creates the spark, the hockey stick graph that you see of people living on only $3 a day or less, and boom, it goes up all of a sudden. And that is the greatest period of poverty relief that we've ever seen in the history of humanity. And it's created ostensibly by, even if it's, we weren't thinking of it, those people weren't thinking of it at that time, by believing and working with the people around them. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah, that hockey stick of human history, right? I mean, it's, it's, um, it's about as stark as it gets in, in social science. There was something that happened that all of a sudden took us from thousands of years of subsistence poverty to a prosperity that, you know, generations uh, couldn't even imagine what, what, what the next generation would be living through. And I think it's important to recognize that we are still on that trajectory as a society. I, I think we, can, we, we need to be very uh, wide-eyed and sober about the, um, about the real challenges uh, in front of us. And we have to recognize that it is not by any stretch a guarantee that we will continue on that path. But it is still the best time to be alive. The United States is still the best country to be born in. And so we have a lot to celebrate uh, about the way that our society works, but we can't take it for granted. And so what we argue in the book is, as you point out, is we have to learn these very clear lessons from history that when we welcome more and more people into what we call the principles of human progress, this notion of a society based on equal rights where everyone has something to contribute and we organize ourselves to allow, to, to enable them, to empower them, to find their path to contribution, which is the history of our country. You know, we've never been perfect. We've never lived up to those ideals. From the beginning, there were glaring and, and monstrous imperfections in our, in our society. But the history of progress in our society is, has been one of struggling to further and, and more fully embrace this notion that everyone has something to contribute and we ought to organize ourselves to recognize that. So if we, stay on, if, if we continue to fight the, the challenges in front of us with those principles as our North Star, we ought to expect that that hockey stick of human history is not just going to continue, but that that curve is going to get steeper. Right. Progress is uh, can be exponential going forward. But we've got to recognize the, the drivers of progress, these applying these principles. You know, what kind of characterizes the liberal project, the, the free and open society. Uh, that's what does it. And we can't take that for granted. And, and every time we confront a challenge, we've, we've got to recognize there's no shortcut. You, 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 you got to apply those principles. And, you know, it's the principles that an organization like the Acton Institute works for its principles that the organization uh, that I lead stand together is, is founded on. And I think there's, you know, there's a time right now where we've, we've got to all kind of take that very seriously and, and treat it as a call to action. That, that lesson from history, you know, now is the time, uh, now is our time to really lean into those principles to solve the problems in front of us. Yeah, that's what I, I hear the echoes of in your discussion of obviously believing in people and people who have otherwise been overlooked. Uh, the echoes of one of the key things we talk about at the Acton Institute, uh, which is the inherent dignity of each, every individual human person and the development of the gifts that they are given by their creator in order to flourish personally and to help their communities around them flourish. Something else I want to talk about that's, uh, that you discuss in the book is this concept of principled entrepreneurship. Uh, could you define what is principled entrepreneurship? What are examples of principled entrepreneurs out there operating that we can look to? Well, in, in, uh, in the book, we talk about uh, principled uh, uh, social entrepreneurs, but it's based on this notion of principled entrepreneurship in the context of business. And so the principled entrepreneur in the context of business is somebody who uses the resources within the business to create value in society over the long term. And that's the story. That's a huge driver of progress uh, in a country like ours, right? Businesses uh, as a force for good um, in, in our in our country, finding new and better ways to create value um, for all of their constituents in, in our society. 
we think that concept is more broadly applicable uh, beyond business to uh, anyone who uh, sees a problem uh, in society and goes out and and uh, and finds a new and new and better way to solve that problem uh, in a way that that respects these principles that we've talked about. The principles you, you just say, recognizing the dignity of every person. Mm-hmm. So Scott Strode, who I just mentioned, uh, you know, finding a better way to solve addiction. He's a principled entrepreneur, just as a business leader who runs a business in a way that uh, uses the resources of that business to create value in society. How would you contrast this kind of principled entrepreneurship, so the the idea of improving our social situations through the their entrepreneurial endeavors from the idea of what we've called woke capitalism, which you have these businesses who are operating seemingly with a, a clear objective of you make razors or you make whatever your uh, your product is. But they're also engaged in a lot of they think you know, things that they believe are helping better our uh, social society, our civic society. Uh, how would you contrast those two different approaches uh, that that we see out there right now? Well, you know, there's these terms get thrown around woke capitalism, uh, stakeholder capitalism, business roundtable just came out for that. And it's easy to dismiss them. And I do think that they are the wrong approach. Uh, But I I think they're the the wrong answer to the right question. And so I do think we need to take seriously the motivation and and ask ourselves, what is it that they're rising up uh, in order to address, even if we, we, we believe, and I think you and I agree with uh, on this point, that they're the wrong approach. And so, you know, we define the role of business in society as to create value um, through through this principled entrepreneurship. But when you look around, a lot of businesses are not actually living up to that standard. A lot of businesses are uh, benefiting themselves, not by benefiting others, but by rigging the system. What we would what we would say is by appealing to the political system, rather than creating economic value or value th- value through the economy. And so, what does that look like in the book? We talk about that as corporate welfare or cronyism, right? Where businesses and government collude to um, to make money uh, for the businesses, and the politicians, you know, tend to benefit as well um, by excluding competition, say, through uh, regulation. You know, building walls uh, of protection around incumbent businesses to protect their profits, while uh, in, in by by keeping others you know, would be disruptors, new new startups out. Things like occupational licensure, for instance, is a classic example of that. Right? Um, there are some uh, reasonable expectations of safety that that licensing can can ass- can can help to assure in things like the medical profession, but when you start to look at uh, needing to go through you know, 10,000 hours of training and thousands of dollars uh, of expense in order to become a hair braider, right? The, the only explanation for that rule is that we want to make it, we, the incumbent business want to make it harder for people to enter and therefore compete with us. And that's a, that's a micro example, but we see the same phenomenon in a lot of industries now. I mean, you look at the, the bank bailouts of, of a decade ago, um, the banks profiting not by creating value for their customers in this instance, but by appealing to the political system, right? Get, getting rich quick by rigging the system. And so that's wrong. That is destructive, not only to our society, but ultimately to the business. Because when a business takes its eye off creating value for its customers, right? And instead focuses on this sort of get rich quick scheme through government, that business is gonna, gonna get off track. And it's ultimately gonna, gonna be to the detriment of the business over the long term. So anyway, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that that we would say are wrong today with the way that many businesses operate. But this notion that we ought to therefore have um, arbitrary standards imposed by above, in essence, political dictates uh, on business, uh, that's just doubling down on the wrong on, on the failed approach. Right? We we should only expect stakeholder capitalism or woke cap, whatever you call it, to make the situation worse. The answer. I, we think, I think, is is for business leaders um, who share this vision of a free and open society 
to set a, set a better example. What does it look like to succeed by creating value within your business for all of your different constituents, right? for your customers, for your employees, for your suppliers, for your communities, all of the people that you need in order to succeed, right? And that's not altruism. That's not sort of deviating from business as business. That's, that's demonstrating that when businesses operate according to these principles, it's win-win. They win and their communities win as well. I think another example of people are looking for another example, uh, not, we don't have to jump down the big tech rabbit hole, but you've seen Mark Zuckerberg up on Capitol Hill, essentially begging for the government to regulate his industry. And you have you may be looking at that from the outside and going, well, why would he want that? And it's because a enormous company like Facebook knows that they've got all the lawyers necessary to be able to comply with whatever regulations that would be put upon them. But those plucky upstarts, what Facebook was once upon a time, just as I was leaving college, mm -hmm. uh, they would have a much harder time being able to comply with those kinds of regulations. And it serves to keep those competitors out of the space that Facebook is already dominating. It uh, disempowers those people with those gifts who might create something better, but just can't afford in much the same ways you highlighted we had for our Poverty Cure Summit conference. Um, I, I talked with a couple of people about occupational licensure and the it, the example that still blows my mind is you need licensing in Louisiana to be a florist yes uh, to arrange flowers which that's just such a clear example of what could even possibly be the justification for something like that that's right no that's right and 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 you know it seems ridiculous and it's easy to sort of you know laugh at something as as far out as that but that has real effects on people's lives the and and it the people that it hurts most are those who start with the least. And it, it, occupational licensure, it, it, just to follow on this example, uh, it tends to be concentrated in those uh, jobs, which are often the jobs that, 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 that people get just as they're starting out. And so if we raise the cost of employment, it would make it harder for people to get those first jobs in order to protect those people who already have businesses or have jobs, you know, we shouldn't be surprised when people say, wait a minute, Something's not right with our system. There's something unfair happening here. They're right. It is unfair, but it's the corporate welfare and cronyism that's unfair. And unfortunately, and we see this in a lot of instances, we, we discuss this in the book, the impetus when we see the problems that are caused by a top-down approach like li occupational licensing cronyism, unfortunately, it's to double down on that approach, right? And, and try to find new and different ways to have a top-down approach to solve the problem. It doesn't solve the problem. It makes it worse. We touched on that uh, in the last bit of conversation on the political issues and some political issues that can uh, kind of manifested themselves in our current time. You know, I remember often hearing the description of government as it's just the name for all the things that we do together. But if you look at the way that our system has been functioning, that government has been functioning, that politics in particular has been functioning – doing things together really isn't the right name that you would want to to put on that. We live in this peak partisan polarized time. Uh, how do you think we overcome that consuming problem? Um, uh, believing in people seems like a, a a good place to start to me for empowering individual people over though this system that clearly doesn't seem to be working for us, but we seem so preoccupied with it and we seem so consumed by it on a daily basis. How do we overcome that obstacle to believing in and empowering people? Well, first off, I think we've got to push back on that definition of government. <laughs> uh, this notion that government is, is that which we do to, uh, together we make the point in the book, government has a very important role to play in our society, but the, but it's a, it's a, it's a small and um, intentionally limited role, important, but limited. Uh, everything else is the, is the stuff that we do together, right? The role that communities play, that, that our education plays, that business plays. Think about how much time most people uh, spend at work. It, that, that's, that's the stuff that we do together. And, and the, 
the challenges that we have in our country, as we make, the, the case we make in the book, is that um, more and more the experience that we have in business or in, in our communities is an experience of top-down exclusion rather than bottom-up inclusion. And so I, I think there's a whole lot more to be gained by, say, businesses really taking the, uh, the charge of empowering their employees from the bottom up. Again, not because they should do something other than run their business, but because that's ultimately going to empower their employees to create value within their business. They're going to do better as a business when they do that. But their employees then are also going to have a much better uh, experience, and that's going to spill over into, into their lives in, in, in all other areas. And so, um, so, we, so the first thing that I think we need to do in, in terms of getting past some of this, this partisan bickering and this divisiveness in government is we need to stop asking government to do the things that it's just not well designed to do. And that means the other institutions in our society, these other areas of society, they need to step up and they need to you know, do a better job of fulfilling their role in empowering people to, to realize their potential. Um, but on the other hand, we, we need to, we need to, to we don't let, we, we can't let uh, folks off the hook that easily in, in, in public policy and in government. Um, you know, what we found is that uh, when you look for common ground, even with those who on the surface, it seems like you've got nothing in common. When you look for common ground, you tend to find it. And so rather than focusing on those things that divide us, and, and, and it's fine that we have differences, it's good that we have differences, but rather than focusing on, on only those things where we're different, I think we all need to do some work to focus on uh, those areas of common ground. And what we've found through our participation in public policy is that when you do that, you can accomplish extraordinary things. And the story we tell on that front in the book is, is the story of criminal justice reform, which has been um, one of the bright spots in public policy over the past five or six years, and, and really over the past 15 or 20 years, when you, when you expand it to the states, where... Um, a very diverse group of uh, organizations, everybody from the ACLU to the American Conservative Union and, and dozens of organizations in between, got together, and, and we helped to lead this coalition, um, to say, look, the, the way we treat people in our criminal justice system just doesn't make any sense. It's wrong for all sorts of reasons. And there's a better way. And even though the extremes in our, our country want to prevent politicians from coming together to make this happen, we're going to help them. We're going to, we've got their back. If they do the right thing, they're going to get the kind of support that they need to succeed in the political system. And lo and behold, in 2018, at the end of 2018, probably one of the most divisive times in national politics that anybody can remember, um, the First Step Act, the most important criminal justice reform at the federal level in 25 years, passed with overwhelming support from both parties. And we think that kind of partnership with those who you may have a lot of things uh, that separate you, but you've got a lot of uh, you've got common ground on issues like, in this case, criminal justice reform, creating those partnerships where that shows that there's a better way to do things in public policy and in politics. And we think that model can be replicated on a lot of the issues that right now seem very divisive. I think one of the other solutions is not to think that we're going to anytime soon stop disagreeing on a lot of the things that we're disagreeing about, but finding better and more productive ways to disagree with each other about uh, how we approach life. And that would seem to me to very much coincide with the idea of believing in people, that people are uh, individuals that um, we may have disagreements about it, but we find ways to work through those disagreements rather than making it kind of the end all and be all of our lives that uh, it, it seems to be at this moment. And that believing in people can be that um, empowering way of working together even through our disagreements to find better solutions to our problems. Yeah, I, I think that's very well said. I, and it goes back to what you said a, a few minutes ago. If you truly recognize the dignity of every person, you know that has that has real consequences to how you behave. You know, it's not just something you say and then you kind of go about your business. You've really got to take that to heart, and that means you know we ought to be curious about each other. We ought to we ought to be motivated to um, to recognize that we don't have all of the answers, right? We don't know everything. None of us do. And, and that even though we may not be persuaded in the end to change our mind, 
you know, in talking with somebody that we disagree with, we can, we can absolutely learn something both about how we how we feel and also about how the other person feels. And we'll both walk away stronger for that, better for that versus spending our entire time, you know, basically trying to pick people apart and, and, and worse than that. Right. I mean, if, if you, uh, if you take it one step further, if you, if you don't believe that somebody else has anything to offer, if you don't believe in people, you know, you can wind up justifying doing some pretty horrible things to other people. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we see that in our country today. So I, I, I think, you know, well, you, you, as I said before, when you, when you read the title of the book, Believe in People, it can kind of sound uh, like common sense. But I think it's actually a lot more profound given the situation that we're in right now. We've got to start with the fundamentals. We've got to recognize everybody has something to contribute. And we can go from there. It reminded me of a William F. Buckley quote that I heard recently that if you talk to them, 99 out of 100 people are interesting. And so is the 100th, for he is the exception. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. And there's a whole lot more common ground than people think. So if you, if you, if you, um, if you take the time to, to really go beyond the surface, your expectation, I think what, what we've learned is that we've got a lot more in common. You know, we talked, I talked about criminal justice reform as an issue that, that unifies people. You take an issue like immigration. Right, which has a hot been a hot button issue in our country for the past four years. It turns out, seventy five percent of people think immigration is good in our country. People are, are surprised to hear that because the extremes have sort of mischaracterized the conversation as though it's so divisive. It doesn't have to be. Take education is something that is, has been a very um, active discussion in a state like Michigan. Um, lots of differences on education, but there's also a lot of things that unite people. Eighty percent of parents across the country think that the education system is broken. Well, that's something that we can build on, right? Let's let's get together and say, okay, well, if we all think it's broken, let's let's commit to fix it together. And you can go on and on with issues like that that on the surface sort of seem like, well, not really worth talking about. But when you start to apply some of these principles and, and you start to kind of look for that common ground, very quickly you can find um, you know ways to to begin to address these problems that otherwise seem intractable. I want to remind you that if these ideas interest you and you want to hear more about them, you can learn more about them at our Business Matters 2021 conference, an online virtual conference on February 25th from 1 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. Brian Hooks will be speaking there as well as many others. And you can get 50% off your registration with the promo code ActonLine applied at checkout when you go to acton.org slash businessmatters. And if you're interested in the ideas of this book, I want to remind you that the first 10 people to email us at book at acton.org will receive a free copy of Believe in People as well as a free registration to the Business Matters Conference. Brian Hooks is the CEO of Stand Together, the president of the Charles Koch Foundation, and the author, along with Charles Koch, of Believe in People, Bottom-Up Solutions for a Top-Down World. Brian, thanks so much for joining us today on Act in Line. Thank you, Eric. I really appreciate you having me, and it's been a fun conversation. Appreciate it. As always, thank you so much for listening today. Our team loves putting this show together for you every week, and it's so encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can reach our team at actonline at actin.org. Until next week, for Act in Line, I'm Eric Cohn.